Thank you, Nina. It's, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here at the Hudson Institute, which is an uh, enormously influential um, actor in the Washington policy debate, and I'm privileged to be here to talk about Sam Todras' book. Uh, let me first uh, make an announcement on behalf of Nina and Hudson. Um, here they want you to keep your cell phones on. Um, turn them to silent, but tweet as much as you like. Um, it, it's a real privilege, as I was saying, to be here to talk about uh, Sam Todras' book. Um, I'll say at the outset, I'm a Sam Todras fan. I think this is an outstanding book. It's a gem of a book. And I want to make four points. And um, what, what, what we're going to do in our procedure here is I'm going to offer a bit of a, a book review and make four major points. And then I'm going to discuss these with Sam. And then um, we're going to open this up for discussion and debate with all of you. Um, uh, but I get first to make um, observations about this gem of a book. Um, it's not just an insightful and sensitive look at the world of Coptic Christianity. Sam has written a very brave book. Uh, it could easily have been, in Motherland Lost, it could easily have been um, merely a litany of persecution. I say merely with a sense of enormous tragedy because that would have been justified. Uh, Copt versus Rome, Copt versus Byzantium, Copt versus Muslim, Copt versus Protestant, Copt versus Europe, Copt versus Arab. The list goes on. And the legacy of persecution and tragedy on top of persecution and tragedy is so profound that that alone would have merited a deep history by a historian like Sam Tadros. But Sam goes further than that because he also f frames his uh, narrative in terms of copt versus copt, a brutally honest portrayal of the internal divisions, laity versus clergy, pope versus bishops, hermits versus church administration, rich versus poor, accommodationist versus communalist, etc. Sam bears it all. He bears the external history of tragedy and persecution, as well as the internal tensions, which have been at the heart of the Coptic story for almost two millennia. It is, at some points, a, uh, a tale of intrigue among popes and metropolitans and monasteries and conferences, but it is a story of texture and depth, and it is a remarkable story that Sam portrays in all its dimensions, and I think it's really quite a courageous story for doing that. Uh, Sam's book, secondly, is courageous in another way. He takes on the pillars of accepted wisdom about Egyptian history, Albert Harani, for example, and he skewers them with delicacy and precision and subtlety. The target, first and foremost, is the conventional idea of Egypt's liberal age. Now, there's an awful lot of nostalgia in the study of the modern Middle East. Uh, one piece, for example, concerns the idea of a golden age, the idea that uh, that uh, Muslims and Jews lived together in peace and harmony um, and, um, you know, about a millennia ago. Well, as we know, there is more fiction than reality there. Uh, the Golden Age was quite limited in both time and space and was really an outlier in Arab and Muslim history, though I, it's important to note that uh, until very recently, it was always better to be born a Jew in Muslim lands than to be born a Jew in Christendom. Uh, but that's a different story for a different event. Um, but similarly, there's a conventional narrative about Arab history concerning a liberal age, not a golden age, but a liberal age, especially Egypt's liberal, liberal age in the early decades of the 20th century, the time of Zaghloul, the Waft, the Constitution, etc., when Muslims and Copts um, banished their sectarian and religious identities to forge a single peoplehood. Now, this remarkably timed book explains in eye-opening fashion 
how there is more fiction than fact in that idea, that idealized idea as well. Um, he explains how that idea came to be. He explains how so many cops bought into the idea and why, therefore, this idea of a liberal age that was never truly liberal persists until today. And that gives rise to some of the ahistorical nature of the Egyptian political debate that exists today. And that brings me to a third key point, because uh, this very thin tome explains an enigma behind today's headlines. It explains an enigma behind today's politics. Why is it, here's the enigma, why is it that the secular elite that went into the streets in January and February 2011 to force the ouster of one longtime general, Hosni Mubarak, today is the same secular elite behind the empowerment of another general, the Sisi, and the crackdown that is now underway against uh, the partisans of the former president and the Muslim Brotherhood more general. How is it that that same secular elite fought for liberalism and democracy uh, two years ago and today supports, you can call it whatever you'd like, but it's difficult to say it's a liberal and democratic movement uh, in Egypt against um, the forces of darkness, the forces of the Muslim Brotherhood, all in the name of reform and change. The answer, the answer as Sam masterfully explains, not knowing that this book would be coming out in the middle of this moment, the answer that Sam gives is that the process of political evolution in Egypt is almost the opposite of what we think is the process of political evolution here in America. For us, government, the very idea of government and the American idea, the very idea of government is to limit the power of the state and our freedoms, as much as anything else, our freedoms from government, from the abusive power of the state. But Sam explains brilliantly that in Egypt, freedom, Liberalism, independence, actually springs from the state itself. The state is the giver, the fount of education, of opportunity, of rights. The state is the source. And perhaps this, perhaps this harkens back to the Pharaonic, perhaps this harkens back to Muhammad Ali, perhaps this harkens back to whatever. But it is a very different source of political dynamic than what we are used to here. And if you believe that the state is the source, the giver of rights, the protector of liberties, then empowering the state and empowering the strongest arm of the state, namely the military, is sort of the height of what it means to be, in this context, liberal because the state is the source of freedom. It turns on its head the way we understand it here in America, but it makes perfect sense the way Sam has explained the Egyptian dynamic. So by supporting the supremacy of the state against provocateurs and terrorists is, in the Egyptian political discourse, to be liberal, to be free. Read this book and a light bulb goes off over your head, explaining what to many Americans might be unexplainable. And that is a real gift. Look, fourthly, I wanted to just make a comment about what comes through as a sense of personal tragedy. Look, only at the end of the book, first in a footnote, and then just one reference in the text, do we meet Sam Tadros himself? 
as part of